If I missed any announcements, I'm sure somebody will let me know. Uh, so Shabbat Shalom again. And I want to start, I guess, with a confession of sorts. Uh, I'm a prepper. I don't mean that I wear Izod shirts with my collar turned up and penny loafer shoes. I mean, I did, but that was high school and totally different. And all those pictures have been destroyed. I saw to that myself. For those that are not familiar with the term prepper, it describes a person who plans for cataclysmic events such as a global pandemic years in advance. I have always been a planner. My staff will tell you I write memos that look years ahead. And maybe they just want to be thinking about that day or that week. And prepping for things like earthquakes and severe weather and global pandemics is essentially planning for worst case scenarios. It's largely a thought experiment and a modestly expensive hobby Till that day comes when what was in your head is suddenly on the evening news and then you get to see if all of your planning was correct. And when some COVID-19 hit, I was pretty ready. I had my 20-year shelf-stable food stores, which is basically camping food, which thank God we have not had to eat yet. I had masks and gloves and cleaning supplies, and yes, I did even have a stash of toilet paper. We have thus far weathered this crisis in relative comfort in our home. I've taken some measure of pride in being able to dip into our long-held stores of supplies when we or a neighbor needed something. Next time, though, I'm stockpiling yeast. It's the one thing that I missed and has been hard to get. It wasn't a problem this past week during Pesach, but now everyone is baking bread, and I want to thank one of our congregants who brought me over a small jar of yeast. Thank you, Tammy. I planned for a pandemic. But now, as we begin to think about re-entry, I am trying to apply that same over-the-horizon thinking to the challenge of the day after. To be clear, we are not there yet. Dr. Bonnie Henry, Henry is rabbinic authority in our home, and I know from her briefings that we still have many weeks, if not months, of social distancing ahead of us. But God willing and social distancing observing, the day will come, and I'm allowing myself to think about it even to dream about it. In Judaism, the day after is often understood as the eighth day. We learn this in part from this week's Torah portion, Shemini, which literally means the eighth. It refers to the eighth day of the opening of the tabernacle, which was actually its first real functioning day, after seven days of special inaugural rituals performed by Moses, Aaron, his sons, and the other priests. On this official opening day, Moses commands Aaron and the people to bring sacrifices to the temple. For today God will appear to you, we read in Torah, which is, after all, the point of the tabernacle. And so the Parsha begins, Vayahi Bayom Hashmini, on the eighth day. The number eight is significant. One second here. The number eight is significant. If I can just, uh, can't I just need you to turn off your camera. There we go. <laughs> uh, the number eight is significant, very much so. When we think of important Jewish numbers, we think of three for the shovels of earth that we place in a grave. We think of 10 for the commandments. We think of 40 for the days that Moses was up the mountain or that Noah was on the ark and the years the Israelites were wandering in the desert. Seven, of course, is also a Jewish number, the Sabbath day, the sabbatical year, the weeks of the Omer, which we'll be counting tonight. And we just finished Pesach, Passover, one of two seven-day festivals. A week has seven days, which not coincidentally is how many days it took God to create the world. So seven is a number of wholeness and of holiness. But as my colleague and friend Rabbi Tom Alpert points out, Alpert points out, if seven is the number of completeness in Judaism, then eight is the number for starting over. For instance, the covenant of circumcision takes place on the eighth day, in part because it marks a kind of new beginning for the baby boy, one in which he joins the covenant of the Jewish people. But the starting over is never the same. The boy is certainly different after his bris, not just physically, but spiritually as well. Rabbi Harold Kushner has written about this, that the ordination ceremony ended the period of heightened awareness that takes place in this Torah portion that began at Mount Sinai and brought us to a more normal state of affairs. As he writes, on the eighth day, on Yom Shmini, we are challenged to begin living in the day-to-day -day world of ordinary events. This is true, by the way, it's the same thing at the end of Shiva as well, that really is the eighth day that we re-enter the world. 
But I'd add that the day-to-day -day world of ordinary events isn't the same world that the people knew before they got to Sinai. It isn't the world of escaped Egyptian slaves. It's the new world of Torah that they now have to put into practice, a world with new societal rules, with new social ethics, with new customs and new practices. It's not going back to normal. It's going forward to a new beginning. That's the eighth day, a new beginning. Some have called this period of social distancing and isolation that we're experiencing now the Great Pause, and I like that term. And if we look at it for a moment, we can see, as I think I've pointed out before, the hidden blessings in the curse of this pandemic. We are home with our families more. We spend more time with our children. We are rushing less. My commute to work is two flights of stairs and 15 feet. Our skies are clearer. Our neighborhoods are more neighborhoody. And we recognize and honor the true heroes in our community, not celebrities, but doctors and nurses and teachers and grocery store workers and delivery people. And the list goes on, and I encourage you, I really do, to make a gratitude list of your own. So the planner that I am, I am thinking and I am planning for what this eighth day will look like. And what experiences from this great pause I want to hold on to, even as life as we know it begins to reemerge. When I think about the pre-COVID-19 world, there are many things that I hope never come back. Such tremendous inequality and division in our society. Materialism and greed that are the antithesis of the sharing and the caring that I see daily in our neighborhood and across our country. The hashtag for this crisis has become in this together. And it's a much needed sentiment that has for too long been missing from our social discourse and our policies. The fact that the virus knows no borders, no ethnicities, no religions, no cultures, no socioeconomic status has been, I think, the great unifier in what was previously a very fractured world. No doubt some have struggled mightily to maintain their pre-virus conceptions of left and right, of blue and red, of normative and other, but thankfully those social views are also being attacked and brought down by this virus. They too are not immune. Like in the period of World War II, when everyone knew someone who was serving overseas, once again, we as a society have a common thread that unites us. Everyone knows someone who has been impacted by this virus, has gotten sick, God forbid, is caring for the sick, has lost their job, is struggling. No one is immune, and that is both tragic and also empowering. No one is on day eight yet. We are all still very much in the wilderness. Now our Parsha continues, because it doesn't just stop there on day 8, though it, it is on day 8. Our Parsha continues, And a fire went out from before God and consumed the burnt offering and the fats that were on the altar. And the entire nation saw and celebrated and fell on their faces. See, this was the moment, the climax of so much work and ritual. It's what the tabernacle was all about. This was the hallmark of the eighth day, the palpable presence of God experienced by the entire people. The feeling one gets when reading this section is it worked. They did it. In our present context, we'd say they flattened the curve and all that effort paid off. And the people really experienced God's presence and blessing. And we yearn for that day when the doors swing open, when extended families and friends can embrace again and our sanctuary can be full again. Well, as full as it ever was. But our Parsha gives an important note of caution, as tragically what happens next is a lesson for our present day plans as well. We read, and I'm quoting here, Now Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, each took his pan and placed fire in it, and placed on it incense, and brought it before the Lord. A strange fire, an alien fire, which had not been commanded of them, and a fire went out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before God. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what God was referring to when he said, With those close to me I will be sanctified, and before the entire nation I will be honored. Vayidom Aharon. And Aaron was silent. He had no words. Now commentators have speculated for centuries about why that offering that they and Nadav and Abihu offered, the fire, and why they suffered these consequences. But it's the very uncertainty of this story that makes it so powerful for our time, because we don't know why they were burned up by this divine fire. We just know that something went wrong. 
something no one had anticipated. And we learn from this that even with the best intentions, even with the best laid plans, the most detailed preparations, <clears throat> something can still go wrong. It can still all blow up in our faces. As we plan for the eighth day, we must be mindful of not thinking of days nine and ten and beyond. Our getting too far ahead of our skis that all this work and all this effort that we have put into flattening this curve becomes yet another mountain that we have to climb with deadly consequences. We must be measured in our hopes and expectations. The experts tell us it will not be a light switch that we flip on. It'll be much more like the rising of the sun, a slow brightening of the day as day seven recedes and day eight begins to rise. But a new day is coming. And we would be wise, I think, to plan for that dawn. We can start by taking stock, taking stock of things that we learned about ourselves, about our family, our job, and our society during this great pause. And so I'd ask these questions. What do you want to keep doing, even when the sun rises on the eighth day? What lessons can be applied from this tragic period in history to your life now? I don't think that it's right to benefit from a crisis, as that means that one person's gain comes at the cost of another person's suffering, which, by the way, is why we pour out drops of wine during the Seder, to mourn the death of the Egyptian soldiers beneath the collapsing walls of the Sea of Reeds of the Red Sea. But it would be horribly wasteful of us to not learn and not take lessons from this experience, to not apply them to making a more equitable, a more just, a more safe, compassionate, and beautiful world that would be a waste. So I think it can start with our families. What from days one through seven of this elongated social isolation do you want to continue on day eight when the world begins to open? What will you keep out? What will you banish from your lifestyle hoping and planning that it never returns? And what can we plan and build from for our community and beyond? The sun will rise. A new day will dawn. This pandemic will slowly, gradually fade like the night sky, like the dying of the light. But it won't be back to normal. We don't want to go back. We want to go forward. Forward to a brighter tomorrow, to a better tomorrow, to a safer, healthier future. Truly a promised land. Based on the promises we make to ourselves right now, on how we intend to be on that eighth day. Shabbat Shalom. Shikach, Rabbi Dan. Fantastic, fantastic draft. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. High holiday quality, that's good. <laughs>